computer. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, the president of the Artist Talk on Art. This is our 43rd Monday virtual presentation. Um, ATOA has been around for 47 plus years, doing talks mostly on the Lower West Side. We do have our talks at 12 West 12th Street. And when things are safe, we will go back to talks at that location. However, until then, and going forward afterwards, we're going to continue with this format. It has worked for us. We've had people present from uh, Mexico, California, Nebraska, Venice, Italy, Australia. They were in a different day when they presented in Australia. So there, there are some benefits. It's unfortunate we can't be together. Tonight, we have a very special presentation. We have Jacqueline Cedars Gallery, Good Naked Gallery. They're showing video around the theme of the borough, uh, the Kafka quote. Um, this work is interesting. It's deep, it's rich, it's diverse. Uh, the artists are different and unique, but there is a similar sort of trend. There's comedy, there's strength, there's emotion. There's, there's presence in a lot of this work, uh, sometimes light, sometimes heavy and strong. Um, We'll get to have presentations. We'll get to have dialogue, questions, responses, thoughts. You know how we like to do it. The opposite of the college MFA cred. We make it happy here. Uh, share good thoughts. We have a very nice group here. Uh, I ask that you mute yourself if you feel you're going to be on the phone or doing something else. Just be conscious uh, of that. There is a chat function. You can put anything you like in the chat. Uh, we're atoanyc.org. We're a 501c3. Um, if our events are free, if you'd like to contribute, just take a look at the website. We have a calendar now listed on our website. It shows you programming that's coming in the next three months. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, about Jacqueline Cedar, uh, she has a great eye. She's found the solution to a gallery inside her apartment. You know, you put together a lot of things and she's an artist and then you've got something unique. And uh, Jacqueline presented uh, some of her artists in a show maybe about two, three months ago or four months ago, and it was brilliant. These artists were sharp. Uh, they were creative. Uh, it was great to meet them and see their work. Tonight, something different, and I'm sure we're going to hit the same level of sort of quality, and I look forward to it. I'm going to pass it over to Jacqueline. Um, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for doing this, putting the time and effort in, and for all of you taking your time to come out and to... Uh, you know, give your most valuable commodity, and that is time. Nice to see a lot of faces that are familiar and also some new ones. Jacqueline, I'll ask you to unmute and welcome. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, hi, everyone. It, it's so nice to see so many friends and um, some new faces as well. My name is Jacqueline Cedar. Um, just yeah, you, yeah, hi, if sure you can I'm hear me. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me all right. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited to see you all, and I'm really thrilled um, to share five artists' work with you tonight. Um, I, uh, I'm just going to share my screen just to tell you very briefly a little bit about um, the gallery, which started in October 2018. Yeah. I'll just pull up some images real quick so y'all can see. That takes a little bit longer. We have these also if you want to. Oh, wow, this is a full bag. I didn't realize that. Give me those. Oh, someone's back there, but I'm not sure who. Okay, um, this is uh, my home and studio. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Can everybody hear me? Okay. It's ready. It's not feedback. Someone isn't muted. Someone named Audrey. Audrey, could you mute yourself, please? Amazing. Okay, so I'll just go back. Um, I started a gallery in my apartment in October 2019. <clears throat> I had a second bedroom that was available. Cool. She this whole place. A hallway and studio um, that was uh, open. And I didn't want a second roommate. And I had a lot of ideas for curating exhibitions. So I decided to start inviting folks to come paint the walls in my hallway and in my foyer and to come install their artwork in that second bedroom. And um, it was a real joy to start inviting people into my home in this way. I had been following um, artist work always and thinking about shows that I wanted to curate, um, but didn't really have a place um, to host um, these exhibitions. And so 
it was a great experiment that I thought maybe would last for two or three months that ended up um, extending into now um, over a year. It's been a year mm -hmm. and a half now. And um, these are just some examples of some of the shows that I did in my home um, prior to quarantine. And the last show that we did um, was in February 2020. And um, we were supposed to open the following show March, um, March of that year. And we, it was set to open March 13th when everything shut down. And um, it felt like a time, uh, <laughs> as most of us know, that was like really confusing. And um, I thought, well, maybe this is over. Um, but then I was really totally reinvigorated by the opportunity to start thinking about ways to extend the show into virtual space. This is a show that was designed by my friend and architect, Laura, Laura Veit, um, where she was actually putting artworks into, um, into like a virtual version of my home. And um, we had, you know, parties on Zoom where people could look at the works and listen to music and dance. And a big part of the space has always been about bringing people together. And so I, I feel really lucky for opportunities like this evening when I can get to see all of your faces and have some semblance of a social experience. Um, having a gallery in a home is really different um, from having one in a more commercial space, I think mainly because people stay <laughs> for a long time often and, and really like to uh, spend time with the work, spend time with each other share ideas. Um, and I've done a lot of group exhibitions, mainly because I'm, I'm really excited about these sort of overlaps that I see in people's works and um, getting those conversations going. So um, I'll just skip forward um, to some outdoor exhibitions that we started doing in the spring and through the summer where we started hanging works in parks and private properties um, that hosted us. This is in New Hampshire and Peterborough. And um, I've just really been thinking for the last now you know, 10 months about how to extend this world that we're also engaged and inspired by into a space that is possible to feel safe um, inhabiting. And so having these outdoor exhibitions has been um, a really lovely way. This is Chris Lynn, who I think is here tonight. Thanks for coming. Um, so this has been a really amazing way to share work outside, outdoors in a way that feels safer, you know, in COVID times. And um, we've gotten to see the works in different contexts that I, I don't think we would have necessarily otherwise. So I feel really thankful for um, the opportunity to play and explore. And, um, and now cut to, I, I always kind of had an idea that it would be tricky to do outdoor exhibitions in the winter, although now I have maybe an, a goal of doing something in the snow at the end of the month. But, um, but this is um, a video exhibition that I had been thinking about since I started the gallery in October 2019. And this is um, a still from Zebediah Keneally's piece who you'll hear from uh, shortly. And he can tell you that I've been talking about this show for about a year. <laughs> we were, I think, like sitting on the beach last summer and I said, I have this idea. I think it might work with your video and this other woman's video and my dad's performance. And, um, I, you know, I'd just been thinking about this work for so long and eventually all the pieces came together and it felt like the right time um, for something to happen in the winter in a time when we've all been burrowing <laughs> for so long and um, it, we're really feeling the extension of this hibernation and the kind of anxiety but also pleasure and all of this kind of range of emotions that happens in relation to this very strange year that we've had. <laughs> and um, I, a lot of these pieces were made prior to quarantine, but I felt like they really resonated with a lot of the ideas that I was thinking about um, and that I knew a lot of my friends were thinking about. Um, so this is a still from Zebediah's piece, which he'll tell you about and, and talk about how it relates to some of his other works. And um, this is a still from Irrigan Senna's piece, um, which he also made a a many years ago, but um, it really stuck with me. I did a studio visit with him about a year ago and I, I just felt really moved by this work and wanted to figure out how to integrate it with um, other, you know, other ideas. And, um, here is uh, Camilo Godoy, who you'll also hear from. And he posted this video on Instagram. I'm not sure he'll tell you if he even really thought of it as an artwork, um, but I was really struck by it. And I had been thinking a lot about his work in relation to Paula Stutman's video, um, just the way that the body related to the screen, to the space, um, to itself, and um, this idea of kind of disappearing and wholeness and um, loss. And, um, and, and lastly, um, my, my father, Larry Cedar, who's here tonight with my mother, Pamela Cedar, um, they have been working on these uh, one-man shows, these performances, which my mother directs. And um, they'll tell you a lot about it, but I'll, I'll just say 
before everyone starts talking that, um, you know, he's been working on this piece, The Burrow, for a while now, memorizing this text that he's adapted um, from Howard Corlier's translation. And um, I felt that this piece um, could sit kind of, you know, and encapsulate a lot of the ideas that, um, you know, these other artists were working with. And, and I was excited about the title. I was excited about the content. And, and I was excited, lastly, just, um, I don't see a lot of theatrical works integrated with contemporary art. And I, I grew up watching theater and loving film and theater and really wanting to kind of see these in relation to, you know, more like uh, traditional art films. And um, so I, I was just really excited to see how that might bump up against um, these other shorter, more experimental pieces. So there's a little bit of the context of the gallery and of these videos. And I'm, I'm really so thrilled to, um, to hear from these other artists because they've been so generous in letting me share their work. And, and they're all super thoughtful and smart about the way they think through um, their practice. So I'm, I'm excited for you all to hear from them. And um, I will um, be here, obviously. <laughs> so if you have questions along the way about you know, the larger context of the gallery, I know we'll have some time at the end. Um, but I want to maximize time for the artist to speak. Um, so Barry, should we start off with Zebediah? Okay, great. So, and I can't, um, I don't think I can spotlight him, but Zebediah is going to start speaking. And if you haven't used Zoom in a while, <laughs> in the view section, you can turn to speaker mode and he should pop up on your screen. Um, so Zebediah, you can take it away and you can also pin him in the top right corner of his video. He's got an am amazing background playing right now. Um, so go ahead, Zebediah, and I'll mute myself. Hey, thank you, Jacqueline, and, and thank you for hosting us, Barry, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's um, really, I'm really excited to uh, connect with everyone and, and share this work and, and, you know, myself and my thoughts and my being right through it with you all. Um, 2021. Um, so let's see. Um, I don't think I will... I would like to like start off um, with uh, a few stills from my video, which is titled Bagman. That's part of this exhibition. As long as I, uh, here we go. So I'll share my screen and um, can everyone see that? Is that coming up? Wonderful. So essentially uh, <laughs> I really, uh, before I get into talking about this, I wanted to say that, um, you know, one of the things that Jacqueline and I have connected on is that <clears throat> we both grew up uh, as theater kids. So my parents were um, worked on Broadway. So I grew up uh, seeing lots of plays and musicals and this, uh, you know, my, I, my, my being, my sense of self, my way, one of my lenses for viewing the world and, and art is through this theatrical setting. So this uh, this work in particular is um, a vignette. It's a story of a, a, a character, an origin story of sorts. So um, I'm just going to show these. There's no or very little dialogue in, in the video. It's all ambiance. And if you haven't watched it and you'd like to, um, you can get a sense of the atmospheric quality and like the tenderness or temerity that uh, I was really trying to communicate with this character. So um, I call him Bagman and very literally, like it was, uh, it came about from a desire to see a figure completely concealed or constructed from um, used plastic shopping bags, which are ubiquitous and worthless. And, um, you know, I have a sense of guilt about throwing out plastic shopping bags. Um, so, you know, they've just accumulated in a larger plastic bag underneath my sink for quite some time. And I, and I had had the notion of building this costume and, and bringing this character to life. And throughout my performance and video work, like th this, uh, this is kind of a theme to make a, a figure from other materials or to kind of enclose my body in something. And I have some examples I can pull up in a bit. 
but um, I, the original inspiration for this character came because I, I work with another artist. We do a lot of uh, casting in uh, urethane and part of my preparation for doing that work is uh, to put on um, a Tyvek suit and an apron and a respirator. And I always cover my uh, shoes and feet in plastic shopping bags. And I was just kind of fascinated by the way it um, manipulated my the form of my feet and uh, abstracted it and <clears throat> um, made them clumsy, uh, made them kind of slippery, made them kind of junky. And um, when lockdown hit, I finally had the time and the space to, you know, bring this character to life. And you know, the, I had these, uh, the best I could describe them as uh, just kind of subtle images of seeing this character in the world in space. And I didn't have um, very specific ideas about what I wanted the character to be doing or how I wanted it to be interacting. So I put on this suit and, um, it was sort of the week before the first video was shot the week before the George Floyd protests broke out. And, um, you know, it uh, is constructed in such a way that I, I could not see out of it. So I was deprived of um, my sight, my hearing was obstructed. And, and I proceeded to walk around um, my neighborhood <laughs> um, without the uh, without my senses, without my guides, without the things that help me interact and orient myself and protect myself in the world. And, you know, there was some very like, I, I didn't really, I see this now that there was some parallel to that action and to what, you know, I was experiencing with regards to the shifts and uncertainty and tumult that were happening in the wider culture at that time. And, um, you know, the effect of me moving through the world with my uh, without the ability to uh, orient myself through my senses was that the character moved very gingerly and tentatively and um, as I reflected on that I started to think about uh, <laughs> the way um, that was working as a metaphor for psychic transformation for my own uh, psychological or spiritual development. And, um, you know, I kind of started that train of thought thinking about shopping bags as worthless, as, as trash, as nothing. You know, they're used and discarded at, our, at you know, our convenience and I judge them and I judge them as useless and I judge them as ugly and I judge them as worthless. And that made me start to think about <clears throat> the parts of myself that I have judged as ugly or useless or worthless over my life. And, and through uh, sort of whatever healing work that I've done that's, that's been a part of my life and, and that underlies a lot of the themes in my work, um, I began to realize that, you know, that any any judgment I've placed on aspects of myself, uh, any negative judgment, has uh, served its purpose and has been um, with like the courage and um, help required to to mine it and explore it has really brought. Uh, about, about great wealth in my being and in my life and the ways I can show up for the relationships in my life. So, you know, I really have come to a place where I believe that uh, there's nothing wasted in a psychic economy. And, and similarly, I don't think there's anything, I'm interested in the idea that nothing's wasted in the, in the external economy or external world, right? That everything has its place and everything has its value if I'm willing to look hard enough at that um, so I later 
you know, I, in read in my reading, I came across the term bagman, and um, and I, I didn't realize that it was a you know a, a dictionary official word. Um, for me, in naming the character bagman, it was more just like it's a man made of bags, bagman. But so I, I checked the dictionary and. Uh, in different countries, the term bagman confers different meanings. So in Britain, uh, a bagman is a traveling salesman. In Australia, a bagman is a homeless person or a tramp. Um, in politics, a bagman is someone who uh, will solicit donations for a campaign. Um, a bagman in the criminal world is someone responsible for uh, kind of moving money uh, from racketeering or number running. And save the Australian example, I was really fascinated about how in all these contexts, a bagman is a person who transmits something of value, right? So um, the whole piece started to take on this uh, air of metaphor about um, what, what value can I see in the apparently worthless. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of bag man. Um, I like, I, I like how you, uh, expressed how, when you sort of suited up in the plastic, you lost some of your sensibilities, some of your sense, sense. And, uh, you did describe a psychedelic transformation is what you were looking for. Often that kind of journey, you have to go in a dark space, maybe you go in an Egyptian tomb underneath a pyramid, you know, you want to, or at night and you somehow switch on your pineal gland. So I like that you were sort of had robbed yourself a little bit and then wandered around much like somebody out of Lost in Space, the low tech version. But it was, uh, it, 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 it's interesting. Uh, we've had uh, Jay Critchley work with plastic bags. He did lights over a gallery at Freight and Vol Volume, very interesting. And then he plastic bagged his whole car. <laughs> you know? And we have other fine painters who paint people who have plastic bags because they're so ubiquitous. Um, but I, what, what I pointed out to that artist is, you know, in the 16th century, you painted drapery. And everybody was wearing cloth. The plastic bag today, as nuts as it sounds, that's your drapery. That's modern drapery and folds. And yes, it's loaded with social content, you know, your sort of responsibility it comes with, you know, to throw away a plastic cup, you know, it's, uh, but it is formed. It gives you the angular breakup. And yes, it's direct social read. So we have come across artists who enjoy working with plastic bags in different ways, uh, uh, powerful. It's, I really like your, um association to the the folds of um medieval painting a renaissance painting a classical painting i think um i hadn't thought of that and it's it's absolutely right it uh it really does um it's it's interesting to relate for me to think about this work in relation to to painting which i haven't done before um how am I doing on time i can share more or if it's time to move on to the next artist we can do that um, shall we open up to a question or two? And then if you want to share, let's engage our crew. And then of course, at the end, we'll always have a little space, but I think if we stay in front, we may be better. Um, question. Open up the chat in case anyone throws in. Oh, I think, I think my dad, Larry Cedar, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I really loved your film so much. Um, uh, in, in its uh, performance of a sort, so I related to it. And I'm just curious, I want to ask you if the same thing happened to you as happens to me when I inhabit a character and it, it, it somehow infuses me with its unique sensibility. Do you still feel Bagman lingering in you in some way? And if so, what is he teaching you that you didn't know before? That's a great question. Um... I think uh, what Bagman is teaching me and, and he's still alive in me is that, um, how do I say it? 
the there is a is teaching me to bring a a, a tenderness and um, a sense of wonder about experiencing the world or um, bringing to consciousness the new. There, I feel like the, the 2020 brought so much shit to the surface and it left me with a lot to think about the ways I approach others in the world and what my responsibility is in that regard. And um, I think part of the importance of, of performing Bagman for me was to like uh, embody uh, and express physically um, the curiosity and tenderness um, that defines my approach to the new reality I find myself in. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Your character has a sort of an innocence that's almost seeing things for the first time. Like, like we're, we all saw things for the first time in 2020 we haven't expected to see. So that's, what, that's what's so sweet about your film is that he looks so innocent. Like everything he's touching, he's touching for the first time. And so we see things for the first time through him. It's really a great character, great character. Thank you so much. Um, that's uh, the whole film is, uh, is an origin story. So Bagman washes ashore and um, then proceeds to figure out where am I? What is this place? How do, yep. I, how do I behave here? And it concludes with a, a dancing scene which is sort of playing in my background right now, which um, gets to a more celebratory energy of you know, uh, here I am, I'm, I'm alive and I'm moving in space and, and I have this body and it can do these things. And um, it acts as a bit of a counterpoint to the uncertainty in the earlier segments of the video. Great, thank you. Thank you. Very nice, thank you. Thank you so much, Sabada. I think um, we have Irgen next, Irgen Senna. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me well? Wonderful. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Barry, for organizing this event. Uh, it's so cool to be here. I'm going to start with uh, sharing my screen. So uh, we'll start with a slide. Um, so here, this is a still from the video that was presented. Uh, now, this piece is an old piece of mine. It's from 2009, uh, but nonetheless, it's an important piece of mine uh, when it comes to my process and the development of the work. Um, a little bit about my background, I started as a painter and uh, little by little I started to moving towards uh, moving pictures. So time-based work because uh, dealing with uh, a single image and the frame of it kind of didn't suffice for my interest of the time. And I started to think about pieces that uh, disclose certain, certain potential through time, through the duration of the process. So the process and the, uh, so the duration of it would kind of disclose elements which otherwise I couldn't. And uh, this piece is developed in that kind of logic. So for the ones who have not seen the piece, it's basically my family and I. Uh, at that time, it was the first year that I moved to New York. So I moved in 2008 and the piece is from 2009. And uh, so I was in New York, my parents living in Albania and Tirana because I'm originally from Albania and my sister's living in Toronto, Canada. So it was one of those rare occurrences where the five of us were able to come together, right? So this video is recorded in Toronto and uh, being here for the, for the first time, right? Coming from a completely different worldview basically if i can call it that way and moving to new york which is a completely different country different culture with different concerns i'll call it rather than uh, than the country i came from so i was very skeptical and questioning everything surrounding me at that period of time so uh, dealing with this kind of skepticism i had about the re reality that was surrounding me i thought how about if i go to the core of it like what really makes the relationship to the other part of the world, right? Which is basically my family and, and, and kind of question that, that structure, that reality. So I was digging through the family archive. I, I love archives, I have lots of things, right? So uh, 
and I encountered that picture, uh, a black and white picture, almost tarnished by time, right? And uh, that picture actually was recorded prior, the prior to collapse of communism. So I was a very little kid. And I wanted to kind of, I had this idea of having all the members of the family kind of uh, uh, sort of re-experience what it means to recreate a certain moment, right? A moment which in a photographic sense is like uh, one something of a second. And I wanted to, to experience that in a longer time. So there is an off camera voice and that off camera voice on the piece is basically an individual who is looking at the original photograph and is giving us directions to, to go as close as possible to the positions, like composing the image to as close as possible to the original photograph, right? And so we were doing this and it lasted for like four to five minutes, something like that. And all that, all that, uh, uh, that struggle kind of to keep the pose brought to the surface certain things, which to me was, was of interest, right? It really, it really, that concern that I have, I had when it comes to questioning the structure or how it feels to, 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 to relive a moment in a new context, which is a political new context, economical new context, and geographical new context. When, when things from different parts of the world are kind of uh, entering this relationship, right? Because like my, my life in New York is different than my parents' life in, in Tirana, Albania, or my sister's life in Toronto. So that kind of uh, uh, decontextualization and a new, new context of our lives kind of was colliding in that very moment. So the video was made, making those, those things clear, right? So it, it comes, it starts as a nice family portrait, but what it unveils is something, I guess, and I hope, deeper, which is more of a struggle to keep something less, right? So, uh, so that concern that I had with, with, uh, with, uh, with duration and, and the possibility that duration has to unveil certain things in relationship to a still image uh, is a moment of, of importance in my practice because uh, it influenced uh, what I have done afterwards, right? Because this is a piece from 2008, nine, as I said, it was recorded towards the end of 2008. So, uh, so this is a, a, core, a core piece when it comes to what I have done uh, later on. So what I'm gonna show you right now uh, are other pieces, which are, have this as a, which have a relationship, right? Because through time then I started to have the need to move to physical work, right? I needed that kind of physicality. I needed that, that, that a body, if I can call it, but how to translate this filmic language into a, an object, to, to, to work, which has a physical presence, which is not a screen, right? Because my life at the time was, was divided between screens, right? I was communicating with my parents through, through Skype and then my work, I was doing video editing and then I studied, so my life was screen, right? So how to translate that language to a physical world. So then I did this piece. Now my presentation is not chronological. So, but it's more how to create a, a relationship from piece to piece. So uh, this is a piece which I've done a few years later. And, uh, and you can see it's a, it's, a, it's a sculptural piece, but still having this concern of mine that I, I've always want, was interested in drawing as well. Like drawing has always been a, a, a tool that I've used in my practice, one form or, or another, right? So, and then I started to develop this desire to kind of have uh, sculptural drawings or filmic sculptures. Like I wanted to have this, this languages leak within each other, right? So uh, this is a, a documentation picture of the, of the, of the piece. And uh, this is, the other side of it. And now if you see these panels, all of them on this side, which is, you can call it the frontal side, it's that moment of, a, of a, when you're looking at a picture online and like it takes maybe a second or two or maybe less depending on the internet to load. So when the image is still blurry and that blurriness for me, it's a potential. You don't know yet what it is and like how to prolong that, how to stretch that moment of time. 
right? So this is what you see here are drawings of those very short lived moments, right? And extending them to a, a longer duration. And the platform where this object, I would call them angularly, angular objects, right? Are, are positioned are on this platform, which in a way echoes, if you are within the piece, if you're looking at the piece, echoes that spinning wheel of a loading image, right? Which is, which is here, right? This is the other side, right? It creates, it creates almost a circle. And as I said, I had this interest uh, in, term, it, in adding uh, other objects as well, objects from the everyday life. So, so my personal experience, the everyday uh, uh, images from my archive were of importance to me. And the whole point was how to bring them together to, uh, to, to a certain level that they would create a new context from this uh, distinct elements and how when they're brought together, they create a new meaning, right? And I, I'm not, this is a detail from the piece, right? Here is still the loading. And on the side, I used every, every side of, of these panels, of these wooden panels. Like uh, there's a drawing here as well. So drawing for me and dealing with digital images prior, drawing to me brought a new efficiency or maybe a non-efficiency, if you can call it, if we're considering efficiency in terms of like how fast is an image is produced, that slowness the drawing kind of offered that slowness of experience to me was crucial. So this is the same elements, but composed on, on a different time setting, if you can call that. So considering that the platform a moment of time, right? Like it's shrinking it here to bring them together. So it's a different, different form of composing it. Hogan, who would you yep. say some of the artists, uh, whether they're sculptors, uh, video art, artists, um, that you respect, maybe from art history or contemporary art world? I mean, of course, there are many artists I respect, and I love the question respect because, uh, yeah, I want to consider in terms of respect rather than influence, because usually I try to not be influenced, even though, of course, the influence is coming from within. We are all educated. We all went to school. So I try while working to not consider any other artworks. But of course, there is a like Matthew Burney, for example, when it comes to video. I like uh, Bill Viola. I like uh, when it comes to when it comes to to, to collage. Uh, so so uh, Rauschenberg, right? Rauschenberg is, is 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 a big figure, which I I'm very interested in him, right? So there are many, and there are of course there is there is a Caravaggio and, uh, and lots of people from different periods, lots of artists from different periods. Seems right? like there's always Caravaggio today. What's up with that? It's always Caravaggio. It's, all, it's an important figure. How would you not love Caravaggio? Of right? course, of course. <laughs> so this is, this is another, like, I'm going back in time, right? This is like the very beginning when I started experimenting with this moment of having distinct, distinct images from different contexts, bringing them together and having this platform as a form of uh, providing a new context, right? But for me, differently than a, a, a collage, which is on a flat surface, when you have this simultaneous experience, right? When you see everything in front of you, for me, I wanted to bring that moment that I love from film, when your experience is one image at a time. So memory is involved. You make sense in a film by the memory of what you saw previously, what you're looking now and what you're gonna see later. So I wanted that, that form of experience to be translated into these objects, right? So, and, but at the same time, I didn't want to disintegrate the images from each other by combining, but I, I love the idea of composition rather than just combine, which has an image here and another here. But while you're moving around, another image is being disclosed and then another, and then another, and then you make sense of the entire thing. So that in between the images for me is where the work consists, right? Because it, it's a moment when the relationship is developed. Now, this is another piece. It's roughly around the same time, which we're talking about 2013, 2014. And then here, it's a moment when you see that more objects and, and materials are being, uh, are being uh, used in the pieces, right? So, and some, some, some materials, for example, this tooth, 
uh, toothpaste box is used in, in another film I've done. So in the exhibition, I had this piece and the film together. And while you're watching the film, you had the memory that, oh, I saw this, right? And how does this relate, right? So this, this, this short-lived moment from one piece to the other and how each piece echoes the other, right? And then there is this other piece as well, which is a floor piece, right? This is a moment when I started to, to kind of uh, have floor pieces, not pieces with a custom-made pedestal. But this bodily, uh, uh, this physicality uh, and uh, what, what was crucial to me, right? That this, that made the move from just a, a film-based work. And this is a nutrition drink. We're talking about bodies, nutrition drink. It's like usually used by old or people with uh, weak immune systems to kind of to kind of uh, boost their immune system and their bodies. So in this context, it's, it became a sculptural material. So yeah, this uh, nutrition drink. And then here I started to use aluminum as a, as a structure. This is the beginning of using aluminum. This is between 2015 and 2016. Right, and certain images um, most of the images come from, from, come from screens. Some come from my video work. For example, this image here of the top comes from a video work. Uh, other images come from, from uh, photograph I've se photographs I've seen in the internet, right? Other photographs I've taken. And I have this archive of imagery, which very often they circulate from piece to piece, right? I, I don't like to use the word uh, repeat them. I, I actually love to say I reposition them from one piece to the other. And they will create a new meaning by having another image next to it, which provide a new context. So this is an, another angle of the same piece. This is at Fresh Window Gallery. So this is, this is another piece. Uh, now we were coming more to our, to, to, closer to our present time, right? This is uh, maybe 2017, 2018, right? So this is another, uh, another angle. This is where an, like, the relationship uh, between an everyday object or a cultural object, if I we can call the baseball bat with, with, uh, with this, uh, Sculptural material on top. You can hear. This is another piece. Uh, Here again, I, I just yeah. want to, um, I see a question in the chat. Um, so oh, I'm you, sorry. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I just, I, I love everything you're showing, but just in the interest sure. of time, maybe we'll just open it up. She says, um, Sophie is asking, how do you select the loading images that you include in your work? On, the, on that other piece, right, on the, cir the circular piece. Uh, the images were selected at, I had, I had uh, every time I had that happening, I, uh, every time I had that happening, I had, had a screenshot and I had a collection of those. Now, now uh, the process of choosing some from the many I had that's a, it's a more kind of an intuitive moment where like an image is all, almost decipherable what it's going to become. And other images are pure abstract imagery, which I have no idea uh, what they will become. I love that moment of potentiality when I had no idea yet what they were becoming. But at a certain moment, like when you see the one with the dog there, which it's clear that it's going to be a dog, right? That's a moment of kind of, yeah, but you need a moment of clarity almost, right? So, but again, it's an intuitive process. Like through time, I've been, all, all my practice has mainly been primarily very conceptual. And through time, I started to kind of give more, more, uh, more uh, prevalence to intuition, right? And many of the choices are very intuitive. Uh, Christopher Lynn writes, really interesting moments of slippage. And I think you hit on something. We all watch these images come into view and there's something beautiful right there. It's digital distortion. It's not full object, but it's something very creative. And obviously, and it, uh, 
catches the object in transition. So it's not defined. So you, you hit on something real smart. You, the way you put things together, the installation, the, the sort of cleanliness is really something. It's almost like architectural, hard to say where you get that, but it's uh, brilliantly done uh, and it reinforces the work. I mean, you're coming from a strong intellectual side. I almost want to ask, are you what are the philosophers that sort of influence your work? Uh, there, I read philosophy. I would not call myself an avid reader, absolutely no. But uh, again, there is a risk, which I, I think there is a risk with artists and philosophy. The, the risk that I find is when you become the illustrator of the philosophy you read. We, as an artist, you're always an amateur philosopher. You cannot be other than that. So, so I try to avoid that risk of becoming an illustrator, right? So, uh, so uh, of course, what you read, what you see, what you eat, a phone call with somebody from the other side of the world will influence your work, right? Uh, a moment while you're walk, walking on the street will influence your work. I'm very open. Like I see the artist as a person with antennas, right? Open all the time. And there is one, one thing that will trigger an idea and I keep those things open, right? So I would not say that philosophy has not influenced my practice, but I try to have the work build itself rather than me a kind of, in a dogmatic way, try to impose my knowledge, I let the work create its own knowledge. And that is a moment of surrendering your ego, right? There is a moment that you kind of give up on your desires and let the work deal with it. And for me, drawing as a tool to create images has been the drive for that because the way I draw takes time. It's time consuming. And that creates the possibility for, the, for me un to understand the work, right? Because if I, if I was using photographs of those images, to a certain degree, the work is already finished prior to you producing it. I wanted that drawing process to allow the possibility to, to, to slip, since we use the word slippage, to slip from the plan, right? G going away from the plan, to me, is a crucial moment. And like all these pieces that you see, in the beginning, I always had a tiny little model of the piece, and then I, grew, I, I kind of made it on a larger scale, like for example, this is, but little by little, I realized that the most successful pieces, at least for me, were the ones that started without a model. And I kind of get, got rid of the idea of the model because it's, if something works fine in a very small scale, it doesn't necessarily translate the same quality in a larger scale, right? So I kind of gave, gave up the idea of the model and I let time kind of uh, suggest of the process suggests the trajectory that the piece is going to take. Right? Perfect. Here, this image works really nicely. You know, your work, uh, it really stands strong. You know, you're a combination minimalist and maximalist. Uh, it's both intellectual, you know, and it is sensual. Very nice work. Um, I want to thank you. We'll move forward. We'll have more questions at the end. I want to move to Camilo uh, Jade. Again, this is Artist Talk on Art. This is our 43rd Monday talk. This is Jacqueline Cedar's Good Naked Gallery. Uh, several, five video artists are presenting based on the exhibit that's currently up the borough. Um, Camila, welcome, and where are you coming in from? Where are you Zooming in from? Hi, Barry. Hi, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zooming in from Manhattan, uh, and it's a pleasure to virtually see all of you and gather here. So I'll just share a screen and... Um, here we go. So Jackie, um, ha, you know, we, we're colleagues uh, at the Whitney and uh, we've known each other for a couple of years now. And um, at some point last year, Jackie just, became very interested in this post that I made on my Instagram. And I treat my Instagram account as a kind of virtual archive process space. So I post a lot of readings and artworks that I'm seeing, um, clips from 
video searches that I've done as a way to just archive them and that I can go back to and that I can that can be of some interest to other people who follow me. Um, and on September 25th, 2019, I posted this, um, which uh, had been just a few months after my mother's death. And I developed all of these bald spots on my head and just decided to record them. And the, the caption for this post was, last night I went to bed thinking about this stanza from a poem by Alice Walker. This we know, we were not meant to suffer so much and learn nothing. And then I just talked a little bit about, you know, when my father died, uh, confronting a similar experience where my body was, uh, my hair was, um, uh, where I, some of my hair was, was, was leaving my body and uh, was developing these uh, bald, bald spots. And um, I made this post and Jackie sort of reminded me many times of, um, of how uh, interested she was in, in, in this video. And for a couple of years since then, in 2000, um, this is 2019, um, the prior year in 2018, I cut my hair and I used to have hair that would go all the way down to my butt. So I had been carrying long hair since I was a teenager and just a few months before my mother's death in December of 2018, I just woke up and I said, I need to cut this, I'm exhausted by it. And my mother had always wanted to see me without long hair. And um, I think just unconsciously, I sort of knew that my mother was journeying to death uh, through a severe illness. And um, I just knew that somehow I wanted to gift my mother this sort of image of her only son with short hair before her death. Um, and so she got to see that. And uh, the day that I cut my hair, I decided to work with a videographer. I was in Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, for a couple months for a residency. And uh, I texted a friend uh, who's an artist based there and I asked her where I could sell my hair. And uh, she took me to a street and I decided to work with uh, two videographers and uh, record all of that. So I'll share a couple of clips from that. But um, before I move on, I, I just wanted to share a, a couple of uh, references to the visual culture of hair as it relates to grief uh, and death. Uh, and this is a, a bundle of hair extensions uh, that uh, were removed, stolen, uh, from a, a tomb in ancient Egypt that is about 4,000 years old um, and that now lives in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, but this idea of hair extensions as uh, to exist within a tomb for the afterlife of this diseased person um, really interested me and, and just this idea of that the ancient Egyptian notion of, of the afterlife is one in which uh, precious objects are kept in the tomb so that that person uh, could have that in that afterlife. Um, and the whole process of mummification as a process of, of grieving, but also celebrating that the afterlife is the best thing that will happen to the person. Uh, and this other image is uh, an engraving by uh, Theodore Debris, and it represents uh, a group of about six uh, women who uh, belong to a Native uh, American community in present day Florida. And uh, the way that this image was historicized is that uh, the women uh, performed these mourning rituals and then the, in which when their husbands would die, uh, they would come to their burial site and uh, leave their husband's uh, belongings and then perform this ritual of cutting their hair just below their earlobe and the remains of their hair would be scattered across the landscape. Uh, and the women would only be able to remarry once their hair was past their shoulder. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about these images of, of uh, how death and death rituals are uh, represented visually across time. 
Um, similarly, during the Victorian era, um, in the 19th century, in Europe, as well as in the US, um, a lot of uh, white uh, families uh, preserve uh, the remnants of their loved ones by cutting a piece of hair um, and either making a very elaborate wreath, which I will show in a couple of seconds, but also just making these notebooks. And this is um, something that I found on, on eBay a couple of weeks ago when I was just researching this uh, Victorian era style of uh, uh, keeping a document of a dead person. And so this is a, a, a notebook of an entire family, in which just these pieces of hair were cut of a dead person and then um, sewn onto this uh, notebook. And then the name of that person was written underneath. Um, and then this is something that's to me the most fascinating of the period of the Victorian era, which is um, these hair wreaths in which um, a diseased person or uh, an entire family, uh, in this case, uh, this photograph uh, represents the, the the three people who died and uh, their hair was used to make this elaborate sculpture. And there are hundreds of these um, in the United States as well as in Europe. And it was all started when uh, Queen Victoria, when her husband died, um, she commissioned an artist to make uh, this uh, type of sculpture with her husband's hair. and. Uh, everyone began to appropriate the style of uh, mourning. And, um, and so I will just share this footage from um, 2018, which is something that was living in my hard drive for years. Um, and I didn't start working on it until um, November of last year, uh, I think. Uh, I just got, had gotten so busy with other projects and um, just kept all this footage of the day that I cut my hair in Sao Paulo on a hard drive and didn't really touch it, didn't know how to work with it. Um, and I think the pandemic and uh, living with so much collective death, you know, uh, uh, really uh, the whole conversation about mourning and death uh, is one that is affecting all of us. Uh, and so I just started working with this footage. This is um, that street where my friend took me and uh, I just uh, was obsessed with all of the kind of um, action that was happening in this street. People were getting their hair braided, people were getting their hair cut, uh, women were in, uh, uh, inquiring uh, about selling or buying hair. Uh, and so this idea of selling my hair was one that had been in my head for a, num for a couple of years. And uh, somehow in May of 2018, I decided to just text my friend and say, maybe it's time to cut my hair. And so I, I um, uh, my friend Melissa took me there and uh, I approached uh, a woman and she, um, uh, asked me to undo my hair uh, out of my bun and uh, began combing my hair with her bare hands and started shaking it. And um, you will see that in just a couple of seconds. So this is Ruth um, and she's a hairstylist based in Sao Paulo. And um, her business consists mostly of, of buying human hair and in order for her to determine the value of hair, she has to shake it, braid it, feel the, the thickness. And, um, and once she priced my hair, I realized that there was no way I was gonna sell it for such little money. Um, and so my hair now lives under my bed in this big portfolio box. Um, but uh, this is just footage that's just part of this rough cut that I'm just sort of dancing with and thinking about. Um, and it's uh, silent so far. It's, I'm not very satisfied with the original audio of the site, um, but um, it's this sort of footage of this moment of, um, you know, releasing uh, a lot. Uh, I had long hair for about 15 years and um, 
all of a sudden in my sort of visual research, uh, I'm confronting a lot of images of um, hair that relates specifically to the this very um, uh, wonderful and strange and very real uh, aspect of, of life, which is death. Um, and this is another hairstyle. Let me, let me ask you, I see Jill wrote a good question in. What drew you to hair as an art form having historical roots? What's a sort of, uh, what, what got you to hair early on? I see all the meaning. It's, I think it's great what you've got here. And um, I, can, I can totally relate. So I know when I cut my hair, when a family member died, you know, 20 years ago, I know how that comes in. I have a theory. Everybody who has really long hair when they're young, they go almost bald when they're older. They go sort of the opposite. Uh, but uh, that aside, what, what brought you to hair? So I was a teenager and I was um, living, I, I'm, I was born in Colombia, in Bogota, Colombia. And uh, one of my sisters, Marcela, uh, was studying graphic design at La Universidad Nacional, which is this large, the largest sort of public university in Colombia and very much the epicenter of uh, sort of youth politics and, and youth movements. And at the square, the main square of the university, um, since the 60s, there's been this large scale mural of Che Guevara. And um, Che Guevara is one of the hottest men uh, who has lived in our society. And one of his co-revolutionaries somebody by the name of Camilo Cienfuegos. And I've had a huge crush on Camilo Cienfuegos because he had this beard and long hair. And so growing up as a 13 year old gay boy, the images of desire and the images of lust were the images of revolutionaries. Uh, and I wanted to look like them and I wanted my boyfriend to look like them. And so I, as an act of rejection of um, um, sort of what a man looks like and beauty politics regarding masculinity and maleness, I said to my mom, I'm not going to the barber shop. So I, she would always take me every month to the barber shop. And uh, at the age of 13, I said no. And it was that sort of desire of rebelling and uh, letting my hair grow. And there was that period of maybe two years where my hair was this mushroom, ugly thing, nothing like this luscious long hair that eventually became this um, big part of my life as an art student in particular here in New York. Um, so what drew me to hair was, um, you know, just sexuality and desire for the, the long hair of the revolutionaries of the 50s and the Cuban revolution and certainly the kind of um, culture of, of hair of, um, that uh, was part of, of that revolutionary cause. Thank you, very nice. Can I, I open it up to some questions and thoughts and then we'll move on to Paula Stutman. Does that sound good, Camilla? Yeah. I'm looking at you. Oh, Barry, I'm just going to say I was looking at his video here, and obviously I love your hair. I don't have any hair anymore, but the interesting thing is the people walking back and forth never even look at you while you're doing your uh, hair dances. I'll call it. It's amazing. Yeah, Larry. You know, and, and this I don't know if many of you are familiar with Jillian Waring, but uh, as a young art student, I was, and I to this day I love Jillian Waring's work, uh, British artist, um, and this piece of her dancing in Pecan, where she just put on some um, uh, uh, headphones and I think a Walkman, and she just starts dancing, and so that piece has always lived in my head, and so. Uh, I had a, a terrible headache that day um, and just realized that there was this beautiful pink wall and that I wanted to dance to silence and just shake my hair as an ode to Jillian Waring and nobody stopped, no, everything, you know, everyone was just, this is the city center, this is the- No one cared. Nobody cared. And so uh, I think it says a lot about just the kind of, um, 
the life of city dwellers and, and the kind of... The, the interesting thing is when uh, you decided to have your hair cut, uh, you went to that place, of course, and uh, when she cut your hair, did she say your hair was what kind of quality? Was it fabulous? Was it spectacular? Was it average? Because it looks spectacular. Yeah, I think that relates to um, a little bit of what Jessica wrote on the chat of how much did they offer for my hair? Uh, you know, I, I was um, interested. I, I interviewed a lot. I, I interviewed a lot about four style, uh, style, uh, hairstylists. Um, right. And I was talking about this idea of, of like, the politics of hair and what is good hair and what is bad hair. And um, growing up, uh, you know, just this obsession by a lot of women to come across, uh, to come and approach me and say, you have such beautiful hair, can I touch your hair? Um, and so uh, go, when I started shooting this, um, I was very interested in that question of like, what is, what, what, is, what determines beautiful hair? And obviously, you know, a, a, a race so and legacy yeah. of hair determines that but um my hair was you know not as um i mean certainly was valuable in the, in the sense that it was long it was straight it was black it was thick um but the economy in brazil there was very odd and so they were offering me um like 500 reales which is like 250 dollars and my hair was about three feet long so right. um yeah, I did not, this, I just knew that I, as an artist, I didn't want to give something that I had been working f uh, for 15 years, that I just did not want to give it to some stranger for $250. Um, sure. Yeah. And do I miss my long hair? Um, uh, you know, Paula, uh, sometimes I do, especially prior to COVID when I would go to uh, a party to dance, certainly, uh, when I would let go of my hair in the dance floor, I, a whole group of people would all of a sudden just take two, three steps away from me and just witness th that um, experience of seeing this long hair just being flipped. Um, so I miss it when I'm dancing, but I, you know, now I'm very satisfied with this. During the um, 80s and the 90s, I had hair, not quite as long as yours, but long in a ponytail. I remember the uh, trauma when my uh, wife and I went to get my hair cut. And then the girl says to me, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, just cut it off. And she goes, you can't just cut it off. I got to style it. I said, style it and do what you want. Then when she was finished, this was the great thing that really shook up my wife. I said, okay, now take the mustache off. My <laughs> wife didn't know how to react to that since I have this over 50 years. So it was like, wow, all right, just a hair. <laughs> I guess my question also is, you talked about what, 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 what drew you to hair, but also when did you sort of realize the link between the grief and mourning and death and hair and, and sort of the history of that too? I, you know, I, the, the video that, that, that Jackie uh, chose, I think it's one that's very telling of how, grief uh, impact the body. Uh, and when my father died in 2014, I had these bald spots on my beard, on my head. And then just a few months after my mother's death, something very similar happened. Um, so, uh, and it was just impacting my hair. Uh, so I had these bald spots, almost the size of a quarter or even bigger. Um, so I knew that um, from an emotional place, that grief was manifesting as the sort of drawings on my head that were affecting my hair. Um, and just from research of just hair, I mean, just like typing in hair on Google or Library of Congress, like all these kinds of things and just reading, um, all these references started coming through. Um, and, and that's where sort of my visual research is um, occupied with at the moment um, and you know it's so beautiful that 4,000 years ago ancient Egyptians kept hair extensions in their tomb as this way of the after of, as this mo uh, as to preserve them for that afterlife um, so and, and that hair grows after death uh, I, you know there's just a lot there um, and uh, 
so yeah, I, I, and I see on the chat a lot of really beautiful references and, and questions. So um, I love to keep those um, coming and certainly email or DM on Instagram or wherever. Um, but um, I also wanna be mindful for our other artists and our wonderful uh, program today. So thank you so much, Jackie and Barry and everybody for um, your questions, comments, observations. Really appreciate it. And I, yeah, I do hope that you'll all continue to stay in touch um, and keep these conversations going. I know we have um, Paula Stepman up next. Thank you so much, Camila. Uh, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you so much, Barry. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up uh, two videos from uh, Vimeo, one that I showed in the exhibition, The Disappearance, and one called Curtains. And there, it'll be about five minutes or a little less of five minutes. And then I'll bring up the screen again and uh, for comments and questions and conversation, okay? The Disappearance, 20 Thoughts, Title Page, 1. An upright naked male figure, black lines against the white of the paper, form his flesh. He stands in space. A dark area on the bottom one-third denotes the ground he is standing on. The space surrounding his body is empty and gray. These elements remain the same in all images. 2. An upright naked male figure, missing his left foot, and left shin. Three, an upright naked male figure missing his left foot, his left shin, and left thigh. Four, an upright naked male figure missing his left foot, his left shin, his left thigh, his right foot, and his right shin. Five, an upright naked male missing his left foot, left shin, left thigh, right foot, right shin, and right thigh. Six, an upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, and left hand. Seven, an upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left hand, left forearm, and some flesh from above the elbow. Eight, an upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, and left arm. 9. An upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, and a chunk of his left chest. 10. An upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, and his right hand. 11. An upright naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, his right hand, right forearm, and some flesh from above the right elbow. 12. A naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, and right arm. 13. A naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, right arm, and a chunk of his right chest. 14. A naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, right arm, a chunk of his right chest, his penis, and his scrotum. 15. A naked male missing his left leg, right leg, left arm, a chunk of his left chest, right arm, a chunk of his right chest, his penis, scrotum, and his abdomen. 16. All that remains of an upright naked male are his shoulder blades, his neck, his head, his hair. 17. All that remains of an upright naked male are his neck, his head, his hair. 18. All that remains of an upright naked male are his head, his hair. 
19. All that remains of an upright naked male is his hair. 20. All gone. Okay, I am just going to bring up one more video. It's uh, about a minute and 33 seconds, and it's called Curtains. So just give me one sec. I want to say I see one of the themes here is time. You're sort of doing a temporal displacement, uh, all the artists. Paula, you're showing what's not there, and you're showing over and over. It's sort of the same figure, but now it doesn't have this. You're sort of stretching the moment. And just as a previous artist said, you want to you know, go into that micro moment, but hold it. You want to capture things before they evolve. It's, uh, I think you're playing with time in a very creative way, all of you. And that's sort of one of the bonds here. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and the nature of I only started making videos during this time period, 2020. Uh, so this was the first one I made, though the images date back to 2018, but the nature of it is uh, of making something um, time-based is the nature of time. But anyways, let me just share a screen. Um, so any questions or comments? My background is in painting and drawing. Um, you know, I work in museum education. A lot of my friends and colleagues are here uh, tonight. I realized at a certain point that my voice is a material, just like paint or paper, and I wanted to use it. Um, and the works I just showed you, Curtains is the most recent one. I finished it about three months ago. And um, I... I don't know what else to say. I, drawing for me is fundamental for my work. Uh, so that's a starting point. Hello, that was so nice to see that new video. I see in the chat, Tina was asking about the sound in the second video, if you could talk about um, what that was and why. This was the sound, did it come across clear? The sound is a summer rain, uh, just for a minute and 33 seconds. It just was, I like the way it sounded. Um, and I wanted to use it. Uh, Larry? Yeah, I, I love your work so much. And um, I was really struck, because I hadn't seen the second one, at your range in terms of the first one being so slow and deliberate and evolving, and the second one being so almost frenetic. And yet, uh, 
the, the effect was the same on me, but through different channels sort of. And I just, um, I just found the energy and uh, the human energy that came through in both of them. But in the second one, it went by so quick. Those are all separate images. There are no repetitions. They are all separate images. And the only constant in the work is the curtain is a constant, except for the last few images, and the yellow space underneath the curtains uh, before it touches the stage is a constant. But they're all separate images. I think it was about 513 images. It's really, it's so effective. I mean, you know, if, if, if art is about the human spirit, boy, you convey a, a, a wide range and depth of the human spirit. I think it was beautiful. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Nicely said. Well, thanks for sharing, Paula. That was uh, very nice. Thank you. Thank I you. Thank you for having me, everybody. So wonderful to see the new work in relation to the, the one we have in the show. And I know we're, we're running a little bit behind this evening, but I appreciate you all sticking around. We have um, two more artists, my father and mother, um, Larry Cedar and Pamela Cedar. Um, Larry um, was acting and uh, adapting the Borough text and um, my mother Pamela Cedar has been directing him in their past few um, solo shows. So go ahead. I'll ask him to unmute. I just wanna thank everybody briefly. This is Artist Talk on Out, where every Monday, I'll do a recap at the end. We have Larry Cedar coming with a brilliant performance. I think you're all gonna enjoy. I wanna thank all the artists who presented tonight just a little bit early to thank you and all the artists that have come to sort of listen in and share. It's hard for us to present. It's hard for artists to be in a show and see each other. Uh, Jacqueline's got a gallery. How does she bring people into her place, her apartment? This is a solution and you guys coming together here, you know, you're, you're part of the solution. I think we've done a good thing. We've gotten given voice to an interesting show. We've had artists express, explain and express and Larry, I'm looking forward. I've seen this already. I know we're all in for a treat here. Would you um, like me to play the video while you're talking, Dad? Uh, we hadn't. We didn't realize we were going to show the video, but that's no, perfectly you fine. Don't, you don't have to, but I can just play it silently while while you're speaking, if you like. Or if you want to just, I don't recall well, I, how long it is. I don't think we have time. I don't think we have time to yeah. play it and speak. But why don't I'll just play so people can see what it looks like, and then you go ahead and um, start telling us a little bit about how you guys got started. That, or I'll get, make it your choice. I have a series of images from that show and other shows. I was going to talk a little bit, so your your choice. Should we do that? Yeah, go ahead and show what you have. Okay, so first of all, um, thank you very much for having us. I am I am honored and inspired by the the work. Um, you know especially during the pandemic, we're all rather isolated. And uh, I tend to think sometimes, I think all artists do that maybe I've lost my mind and that I must be nuts to think about the things I think about and wanna do the things I wanna do. And seeing all of you and seeing your work makes me feel, it's like when I first uh, got in my first play and I thought, oh, I'm not crazy. There's people just like me out there. And, um, and so thank you for that. I'm inspired to continue my work by your work. It's really great. So that said, I wanna just tell you, um, the piece that was in Jackie's show, and thank you for having us, Jackie, is when Jackie asked us for a sample of our work, we were in mid-process of shooting, which is our what is our fourth one-man show, Pam Directs, I Adapt and Perform. Uh, and we had done about half of it, the back half of it. And so I said to Pam, can I just send you this as to Jackie? And she said, yes. So that's what we sent her, and that's what you saw in the show. The piece has since been completed, and it will live stream on February 24th on my Facebook page, if any of you are interested. You can see the whole piece then, it runs about a half an hour. But in the meantime, let me let me sh uh, share, let's see how we do this. I see everyone else did it so well. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Uh, and can you see that? Can you see the image there? Of uh, Okay, so what what's happened over the past four or five years is uh, I began adapting literature for the stage. The first piece I did was called Orwellian. And um, I'll get to that picture in a minute. And uh, I would take, my favorite pieces of literature. I love George Orwell. And I took pieces from uh, Notes from the Underground, Down and Out in Paris and London in 1984. I adapted it into a one hour piece. So subsequently, Pam ended up directing all my shows and she directed that one. We did a piece uh, from Dostoevsky called Notes from the Underground. Then we did a piece by Kafka called Letter to My Father. And finally, the one we're working on now, which is another Kafka piece called The Burrow. So I'll show you a few images and you can, um, you can hear uh, you know, what 
what Pam has to say about some of them. So this is from Notes from the Underground. This is done at the Sherry Theater. Uh, also from the Sherry Theater, Notes from the Underground, Jacqueline did the, our art direction. Uh, she created this fireplace and another beautiful uh, vision of looking out a window, which was fantastic because, you know, art direction can bring the world to life for an actor. And when I could look out that window and see, you know, see the snow and the trees, it just, it just so in, uh, brought my performance. Uh, it inspired me to, you know, to give more. So thank you for, to Jacqueline for that. We, we always try to have her uh, contribute. She contributed, we did a performance of Orwellian in New York at the United Solo Festival, and she did the art direction on that, which is incredible. So I'll just move through these quickly and then I'll have Pam chip in. So I'll let Pam talk about this. This is from Notes from the Underground and this is the set that Pamela designed. Well, um, we had seen another performance where it was kind of dingy uh, earth and where, like just earth and, and the guy was just in a hovel of a place. And I wanted it to be uh, where it was called the Underground, but it was actually his castle. It was actually his palace. So we, we tried to give more um, the, in the in the decor that I brought in, I tried to make it more lavish, elegant. I mean, and like most people who hear notes from the underground, they think a guy living in a cave, and he's just some dirty, you know, guy hermit. And Pam said, you know, maybe he just thinks he lives in a cave, but he's actually quite, you know, sophisticated. So Pam brought in each of these pieces we have in our house. She just, you know, she pulled from objects in our house, and because we couldn't be it in the theater more than the three nights we had it during the week, we would load it in and then load it out and take it home after each performance. We couldn't have it there during the day. So it was a, it was a quite an involved process and I was very upset about how much Pam wanted to bring in because I like to work light. I like just a black stage, you know, with just a chair. And she said, please let me do this. And I was so glad I did because she, again, like Jackie, she helped create that world. So that's notes from the underground also. This is, this is uh, Orwellian. This is a scene from Down and Out in Paris and London, the, uh, the, uh, the, the plungeur, the dishwasher. Uh, this is from Orwellian also. This is Winston Smith, who's the protagonist in 1984, talking about what it's like to live in a totalitarian society. Uh, this is a scene from our, the one previous to the one we just did. This is a letter to my father uh, uh, about uh, Kafka's actual relationship with his father and his, a letter he wrote to his father, which he gave to his mother to give to his father, but the mother wouldn't because she was concerned at how upset the father would get. So the father never got the letter. So that's this one. Again, this is our home. So this was our decor here. <laughs> also, letter to my father, one of the scenes. Uh, letter to my father. And again, Pam brought in all the art direction. And uh, again, letter to my father. This is a mannequin we've had sitting in our house for. Oh, Jackie brought it home one day. <laughs> For many years, yeah. So, so you from know, college, I guess it's just never underestimate the artistic value of an object. Of course, you all know that. And she represents the the loves of your life when you're talking about Correct. wanting to marry but not being able to marry. Exactly. And then this is finally from the the one we gave to Jackie for her show, The Burrow. Uh, this is one of Kafka's last pieces, and it's based. I call the the protagonist a creature because you're not sure if he's a man or if he's an animal because he talks about killing and eating other animals. But he's basically built a labyrinth, a world underneath the ground that he hides from the very threatening surface world and how he deals with that. So why don't you tell about how we framed it instead of the show? <laughs> well, we were, had all different ideas and we actually just threw it away and decided just to film it right in this one dark space and not go anywhere else. And um, it worked. It, it felt good. We talked about a lot of, we have a lot of locations in the house, corners and nooks and crannies that we use for a letter to my father. So we were talking about that. And then we found a spot in the house that we could make dark, like a cave. And we started to film there and we said, okay, where should we move next? We tried a couple other places. And then we finally ended up saying, let's just keep it here. He's in a cave. It could be three feet by three feet for all we know. So let's just keep this guy in this claustrophobic world. And, and at some point you maybe see a doorknob and you maybe see some background imagery that doesn't fit. And I like that. It didn't bother me. Yeah, because in my mind, when you see that it's not a cave, that it's actually someone's house, there's a doorknob behind you. For me, it made you realize that maybe this guy is a crazy person who thinks he's in a cave, but it is in fact in a corner of his house. So there's all kinds of possibilities. Um, as far as the process goes. Maybe, go maybe Jackie wants to show the other imagery. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jackie, whatever you want to show. 
Oh, sure. Okay, I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up while you get, go ahead and keep, just um, close yours out and go ahead and keep talking while I share. Okay, so I'm not sure how I close it out now. Gotcha. That I, got I got that. Okay, thanks. So as far as process goes, as an actor, you know, the, the, the bane of an actor's existence is that he hardly ever gets to act. Uh, you spend most of your time waiting for interviews or hoping to get an interview and then you get it and you hope you get the job and if you get the job, you hope they don't cut you out of the movie, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm always, I always say my mind is like a, a furnace. If I don't put stuff in it to burn, I'll consume myself. So I'm always looking for material. And it started with Orwellian and the minute I finish one, I'm on the search for the next. Um, and so this is how it's happened. Uh, I'm already planning my next one after this one uh, because it keeps me alive. It keeps me, uh, like I said, from consuming myself and from losing my mind. It keeps me in the game Tell and the sharp. You know? The next one, I'm not exactly certain if it's gonna be, I formed a relationship with a, a writer and translator in London named Howard Collier. He's a brilliant man and he's a Kafka somewhat of an expert. And what happened is I stumbled across, I was gonna do Letter to My Father and I had an old translation. I stumbled across his, which is a newer one. And I never occurred to me how different two translations can be. His piece, his translation of, of um, The Burrow or Letter to My Father was so much more alive, so much more contemporary, so much more accessible. But I knew that I would have to get the rights from him because it wasn't in public domain. I wrote him and he very kindly said, whatever you wanna do with it, you go ahead. I was stunned. So I took his adaptation and reduced it down to my adaptation. I did that. Afterwards, I spoke with him and I said, have you ever thought about doing The Burrow? He says, well, I haven't recently, but it had crossed my mind. Why don't I send you an adaptation of The Burrow? He did that, that's what we just worked on. So I love his work. So now he's written another piece called 1938, Hitler Takes Vienna. And it's about uh, the, the evening that the Nazis uh, invaded Vienna. And how everyone, of course, abandoned this bar, except for one man who stayed to tell the story of his life, because he, he said, let them take me. Let them take me. I'm going to tell my story. And it's also a short piece like The Burrow. And I was so affected by the theme of it that I called him right away. And I said, I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself here. I know we barely just finished The Burrow, but would you give me permission to do Hitler Takes Vienna? And he said, yes. So um, my dream is, our dream, <laughs> is to go to London. He has a theater there called the Jack Theater and do all three pieces eventually in London. But obviously that's not gonna happen for a long time. Well, uh, I just wanna say one, one last thing. If, if you are interested in seeing the complete version of The Burrow, like I said, follow my Facebook page. Uh, it's gonna air on the 24th, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, but there'll be uh, more information there. It's about a half hour. About a half hour. Yeah. I do wanna ask you, Larry, what's some of your early forays in theater when you were a young kid? Were you jumping around the couch, making up theater? games what were you playing well I always liked uh make believe and pretend and I realized later in life it's because I kind of wanted to disappear into another world I always say artists are in a sense time travelers if we effectively execute our art we take ourselves and other people into another world I always had a very vivid fantasy life I was the class clown I was always trying to you know just be involved in some any world other than the one I was in so I didn't pursue acting until after I graduated college because I was on, our, on the road to law school and acting wasn't considered an option in my family. Um, but um, so I just dabbled here and there. I knew I loved it, but I just didn't think about it. I just was kind of a crazy, wacky kid. Once I got into acting, I wanted it everything. I wanted to do everything because I, I, I'd been uh, denied that opportunity for so many years and I'm still hungry for it. I, there's no material that I'm not curious to explore so long as it understands and delves deeply into the human condition. I don't want to do trivial surfacing type material. I want to find out what the hell is going on here, how we got here, why we're here, what do we do about it? And that's what the artists, the authors that I picked do. And Pam, I'm very grateful, has an intuitive understanding, not only of the material, but how actors work. And she, she can direct me in a way that uh, helps me to avoid the traps that actors can fall into. So it's been a, we've been very fortunate to work together. Very fun. Very nice. I, I want to make one comment, then I'm going to have Jacqueline just speak a little bit, because I think you brought together an interesting group of artists and all the artists. Uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing. We're Artists Talk on Art. Um, join us on Monday. If you have a panel or something you'd like to put together, reach out to me. Uh, you can see calendars on our website. We have things booked up through May. A lot of interesting talks coming. Uh, from a variety of artists. This talk will go on our YouTube. There's a link on our website for that. And you can see this talk on our YouTube probably tomorrow at the latest on Wednesday. Um, 
Jacqueline, thank you so much again. I do want to give a shout out. Uh, Michael Krasowitz on Wednesday at seven o'clock does a gathering. Uh, artists come and share, is often a musician. It's quite an interesting group. Michael Krasowitz, if you need to reach out to me about it. Uh, Jackie, thank you. I, I, I want to give you the floor to sort of, uh, you know, thank you so much. What a nice uh, group you bring together. Thank you so much for having us. And um, thank you um, to all of the artists for being so generous and um, sharing your work and also really thinking through your process with us and um, to everyone who came to attend for listening um, and asking such thoughtful questions. We really appreciate it. And like I said earlier, um, this social component of looking at and making and you know sharing work is so um, essential to what I think we're all craving right now. So I hope we'll continue to keep sharing. And um, I put in the chat the website link to the gallery. So if you didn't already get a chance to watch the videos, you can watch on your own time um, from home. And then also my email at the gallery. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the other artists. I think would be happy to hear from you. And lastly, I'll just mention that um, we're going to be doing a pop up in Prospect Park February 20th, weather permitting. So um, stay tuned for a snowy outdoor exhibition. And um, thank you all so much again. It was um, such a pleasure as always. Thank you, Barry, for hosting us. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all soon. All right, bye Jacqueline, bye everyone. Thank you so bye. much. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank it's you a pleasure. so much. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Thank you, nice thank you, everybody. Thank bye. you very much. <laughs> Thank you again, Barry. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk soon. Um, I'm looking forward to <laughs> connecting and I hope you feel better. <laughs> Thank you, I do. Thank you.